Justice Sotomayor, with whom Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson join dissenting. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment enshrines a guarantee of racial equality. The court long ago concluded that this guarantee can be enforced through race-conscious means in a society that is not and has never been colorblind. In Brown v. Board of Education, 347 U.S. 483, 1954, the court recognized the constitutional necessity of racially integrated schools in light of the harm inflicted by segregation and the importance of education to our democratic society. I'd at 492-495. For 45 years, the court extended Brown's transformative legacy to the context of higher education, allowing colleges and universities to consider race in a limited way and for the limited purpose of promoting the important benefits of racial diversity. This limited use of race has helped equalize educational opportunities for all students of every race and background and has improved racial diversity on college campuses. Although progress has been slow and imperfect, race-conscious college admissions policies have advanced the Constitution's guarantee of equality and have promoted Brown's vision of a nation with more inclusive schools. Today, this court stands in the way and rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress. It holds that race can no longer be used in a limited way in college admissions to achieve such critical benefits. In so holding, the court cements a superficial rule of colorblindness as a constitutional principle in an endemically segregated society where race has always mattered and continues to matter. The court subverts the constitutional guarantee of equal protection by further entrenching racial inequality in education, the very foundation of our democratic government and pluralistic society. Because the court's opinion is not grounded in law or fact and contravenes the vision of equality embodied in the 14th Amendment, I dissent. I equal educational opportunity is a prerequisite to achieving racial equality in our nation. From its founding, the United States was a new experiment in a Republican form of government where democratic participation and the capacity to engage in self-rule were vital. At the same time, American society was structured around the profitable institution that was slavery, which the original Constitution protected. The Constitution initially limited the power of Congress to restrict the slave trade. Art Berg 9, CL 1, accorded southern states additional electoral power by counting three-fifths of their enslaved population in apportioning congressional seats, Parak 2, CL3, and gave enslavers the right to retrieve enslaved people who escaped to free states, Art 4, Tagger 2, CL3. Because a foundational pillar of slavery was the racist notion that black people are a subordinate class with intellectual inferiority, Southern states sought to ensure slavery's longevity by prohibiting the education of black people, whether enslaved or free. C.H. Williams, Self-Taught, African-American Education in Slavery and Freedom 7, 203-213, 2005, Self-Taught. Thus, from this nation's birth, the freedom to learn was neither colorblind nor equal. With time and at the tremendous cost of the Civil War, abolition came. More than two centuries after the first African enslaved persons were forcibly brought to our shores, Congress adopted the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime. Number one, like all great historical transformations, emancipation was a movement, not a single event owed to any single individual, institution, or political party. E. Foner, the second founding, 2151-54, 2019, the second founding. The fight for equal educational opportunity, however, was a key driver. Literacy was an instrument of resistance and liberation. Self-taught eight, education provided the means to write a pass to free, eat em, and to learn of abolitionist activities. I had at seven. It allowed enslaved black people to disturb the power relations between master and slave, which fused their desire for literacy with their desire for freedom. I bid. Put simply, the very feeling of inferiority which slavery forced upon black people fathered an intense desire to rise out of their condition by means of education. W.E.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction in America, 1860-1880, P. 638, 1935. C.J. Anderson, The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860-1935, P. 7, 1988. 
Black Americans thus insisted, in the words of Frederick Douglass, that in a country governed by the people, like ours, education of the youth of all classes is vital to its welfare, prosperity, and to its existence. Addressed to the People of the United States, 1883. In 4P Phoner, The Life and Writings of Frederick Douglass, 386, 1955. Black people's yearning for freedom of thought and for a more perfect union with educational opportunity for all played a crucial role during the Reconstruction era. Yet emancipation marked the beginning, not the end of that era. Abolition alone could not repair centuries of racial subjugation. Following the 13th Amendment's ratification, the Southern states replaced slavery with a system of laws which imposed upon black people onerous disabilities and burdens, and curtailed their rights in the pursuit of life, liberty, and property to such an extent that their freedom was of little value. Regents of Univ of Cal v. Backey, 438 U.S. 265, 1978, Opinion of Marshall J., quoting Slaughterhouse Cases, 16 Wall, 3670, 1873. Those so-called black codes discriminated against black people on the basis of race, regardless of whether they had been previously enslaved, See E.G. 1866 N.C. Cess, Laws, P.P. 99-102. Moreover, the criminal punishment exception in the 13th Amendment facilitated the creation of a new system of forced labor in the South. Southern states expanded their criminal laws, which in turn permitted involuntary servitude as a punishment for convicted black persons. D. Blackman, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II, PP 753, 2009, slavery by another name. States required, for example, that black people sign a labor contract to work for a white employer or face prosecution for vagrancy. The second founding 48, state laws then forced black convicted persons to labor in plantations, mines, and industries in the South. I'd, at 50, this system of free forced labor provided tremendous benefits to Southern whites and was designed to intimidate, subjugate, and control newly emancipated black people. See slavery by another name 5 to 6, 53. The 13th Amendment, without more, failed to equalize society. Congress thus went further and embarked on months of deliberation about additional Reconstruction laws. Those efforts included the appointment of a committee, the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, to inquire into the condition of the Confederate States. Report of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, S. Rep. No. 112, 39th Kong, 1st Cess, 1, 1866, here and after Joint Com. Rep. Among other things, the committee's report to Congress documented the deep-seated prejudice against emancipated black people in the southern states and the lack of a general disposition to place the colored race constituting at least two-fifths of the population upon terms even of civil equality, I'd at 11. In light of its findings, the committee proposed amending the Constitution to secure the equality of rights, civil and political, I'd at 7. Congress acted on that recommendation and adopted the 14th Amendment. Proponents of the amendment declared that one of its key goals was to protect the black man in his fundamental rights as a citizen with the same shield which it throws over the white man. Kong Globe, 39th Kong, 1st Cess, 2766, 1866, Globe, Statement of Center Howard. That is, the amendment sought to secure to a race recently emancipated, a race that through many generations was held in slavery, all the civil rights that the superior race enjoy. Plessy v. Ferguson, 163 U.S. 537, 55, 1596, Harlan J. Dissenting, internal quotation marks omitted. To promote this goal, Congress enshrined a broad guarantee of equality in the Equal Protection Clause of the Amendment. That clause commands that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. AMD 14, Jack 1. Congress chose its words carefully opting for expansive language that focused on equal protection and rejecting proposals that would have made the Constitution explicitly colorblind. A cull, the colorblind Constitution, 69, 1992. See also, e.g., Kong Globe 1287, rejecting proposed language providing that no state shall recognize any distinction between citizens on account of race or color. 
this choice makes it clear that the 14th Amendment does not impose a blanket ban on race-conscious policies. Simultaneously with the passage of the 14th Amendment, Congress enacted a number of race-conscious laws to fulfill the amendment's promise of equality, leaving no doubt that the Equal Protection Clause permits consideration of race to achieve its goal. One such law was the Freedmen's Bureau Act, enacted in 1865 and then expanded in 1866, which established a federal agency to provide certain benefits to refugees and newly emancipated freedmen. See Act of Mar 3rd, 1865, CH 90, 13 Stat 5007, Act of July 16, 1866, 200, 14 Stat 73. For the Bureau, education was the foundation upon which all efforts to assist the freedmen rested. E. Foner, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 18744, 1988. Consistent with that view, the Bureau provided essential funding for Black education during Reconstruction. I'd at 97. Black people were the targeted beneficiaries of the Bureau's programs, especially when it came to investments in education in the wake of the Civil War. Each year surrounding the passage of the 14th Amendment, the Bureau educated approximately 100,000 students, nearly all of them Black, and regardless of degree of past disadvantage. E. Schnapper, Affirmative Action and the Legislative History of the 14th Amendment, 71 Va L. Rev, 753 781, 1985. The Bureau also provided land and funding to establish some of our nation's historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. IBID, see also brief for HBCU leaders et al. as Amishi Curie 13 HBCU brief. In 1867, for example, the Bureau provided Howard University tens of thousands of dollars to buy property and construct its campus in our nation's capital. 2. O. Howard, Autobiography 397 to 41, 1907. Howard University was designed to provide special opportunities for a higher education to the newly enfranchised of the South, but it was available to all Black people, whatever may have been their previous condition. Bureau Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands, Sixth Semi-Annual Report on Schools for Freedmen, 60, July 1, 1868. 2. The Bureau also expended a total of 407752 on black colleges and only $3,000 on white colleges from 1867 to 1870. Schnapper, 71 VAL Rev, at 798N, 149. Indeed, contemporaries understood that the Freedmen's Bureau Act benefited black people. Supporters defended the law by stressing its race-conscious approach. C.E.G. Kong Globe 632, Statement of Repair Moulton. The true object of this bill is the amelioration of the condition of the colored people. Joint Com Rep. 11, reporting that the Union Men of the South declared with one voice that the Bureau's efforts protect the colored people. Opponents argued that the act created harmful racial classifications that favored black people and disfavored white Americans. See E.G. Kong Globe 397, Statement of Senna Willie. The act makes a distinction on account of color between the two races. 544, Statement of Rep. Taylor. The act is legislation for a particular class of the blacks to the exclusion of all whites. App to Kong Globe, 39th Kong, 1st Cess. 69 to 70, Statement of Rep. Rousseau, you raise a spirit of antagonism between the black race and the white race in our country, and the law abiding will be powerless to control it. President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill on the basis that it provided benefits to a particular class of citizens. Six messages and papers of the President 1789 to 1897, J. Richardson, ed. 1897. Messages and papers, a. Johnson to House of Rep, July 16, 1866, but Congress overrode his veto. Kong Globe 3849 to 3850. Thus rejecting those opponents' objections, the same Reconstruction Congress that passed the 14th Amendment eschewed the concept of colorblindness as sufficient to remedy inequality in education. Congress also debated and passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 contemporaneously with the 14th Amendment. The goal of that act was to eradicate the black codes enacted by southern states following ratification of the 13th Amendment. See Eide at 474. Because the black codes focused on race, not just slavery-related status, 
the Civil Rights Act explicitly recognized that white citizens enjoyed certain rights that non-white citizens did not. Section 1 of the Act provided that all persons of every race and color shall have the same rights as those enjoyed by white citizens. Act of April 9, 1866, 14 Stat. 27. Similarly, Section 2 established criminal penalties for subjecting racial minorities to different punishment by reason of color or race than is prescribed for the punishment of white persons. I bid. In other words, the Act was not colorblind. By using white citizens as a benchmark, the law classified by race and took account of the privileges enjoyed only by white people. As he did with the Freedmen's Bureau Act, President Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act in part because he viewed it as providing black citizens with special treatment. See Messages and Papers 408-413. The act is designed to afford discriminating protection to colored persons, and its distinction of race and color operates in favor of the colored and against the white race. Again, Congress overrode his veto. Kong Globe, 1861. In fact, Congress reenacted race-conscious language in the Civil Rights Act of 1870, two years after ratification of the 14th Amendment, see Act of May 31, 1870, 16, 6 Stat 144, where it remains today, see 42 U.S. C. 1981A and 1982, Rev. Stat, Skegeg, 1972-1978. Congress similarly appropriated federal dollars explicitly and solely for the benefit of racial minorities. For example, it appropriated money for the relief of destitute colored women and children without regard to prior enslavement. Act of July 28, 1866, Fort Stat 317. Several times during and after the passage of the 14th Amendment, Congress also made special appropriations and adopted special protections for the bounty and prize money owed to colored soldiers and sailors of the Union Army. 14 Stat 37, Res. No. 46, June 15, 1866, Act of Mar 3, 1869, 122, 15 Stat 301, Act of Mar 3, 1873, 17 Stat 5 or 28. In doing so, it rebuffed objections to these measures as class legislation, applicable to colored people and not to the white people. Kong Globe, 40th Kong, 1st Cess, 79, 1867, Statement of Senator Grimes. This history makes it inconceivable that race-conscious college admissions are unconstitutional. Baki, 438 U.S. at 398, Opinion of Marshall J. The Reconstruction Era marked a transformational point in the history of American democracy. Its vision of equal opportunity leading to an equal society was short-lived, however, with the assistance of this court, Eid, at 391. In a series of decisions, the court sharply curtailed the substantive par protections of the Reconstruction Amendments and the Civil Rights Acts. Eid, at 3991 to 392, collecting cases. That endeavor culminated with the court's shameful decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, 63 U.S. 537, 1896, which established that equality of treatment exists when the races are provided substantially equal facilities, even though these facilities be separate. Brown, 347 U.S. at 488. Therefore, with this court's approval, government-enforced segregation and its concomitant destruction of equal opportunity became the constitutional norm and infected every sector of our society, from bathrooms to military units and, crucially, schools. See Backey, 438 U.S. at 393 to 394, Opinion of Marshall J. See also Generally R. Rothstein, The Color of Law, 17 to 176, 2017, discussing various federal policies that promoted racial segregation. In a powerful dissent, Justice Harlan explained in Plessy that the Louisiana law at issue, which authorized segregation in railway carriages, perpetuated a caste system. 163 U.S. at 559-560. Although the state argued that the law prescribed a rule applicable alike to white and colored citizens, all knew that the law's purpose was not to exclude white persons from railroad cars occupied by blacks, but to exclude colored people from coaches occupied by or assigned to white persons. I'd at 5 and 57. That is, the law proceed on the ground that colored citizens are so inferior and degraded that they cannot be allowed to sit in public coaches occupied by white citizens, I did at 560. Although, T, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race, 
in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. Just as Harlan explained, there is no superior dominant ruling class of citizens in the eyes of the law. Eyed at 559. In that context, Justice Harlan thus announced his view that our Constitution is colorblind. It was not until half a century later in Brown that the court honored the guarantee of equality in the Equal Protection Clause and Justice Harlan's vision of a Constitution that neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. I bid. Considering the effects of segregation and the role of education in the light of its full development and its present place in American life throughout the nation, Brown overruled Plessy. 347 U.S. at 492-495. The Brown Court held that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal and that such racial segregation deprives black students of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Eyed at 494-495. The court thus ordered segregated schools to transition to a racially integrated system of public education with all deliberate speed, ordering the immediate admission of black children to schools previously attended only by white children. Brown v. Board of Education, 349 U.S. 294, 301, 1955. Brown was a race-conscious decision that emphasized the importance of education in our society. Central to the court's holding was the recognition that, as Justice Harlan emphasized in Plessy, segregation perpetuates a caste system wherein black children receive inferior educational opportunities solely because of their race, denoting inferiority as to their status in the community. 347 U.S. at 494 and N10. Moreover, because education is the very foundation of good citizenship, segregation in public education harms our democratic society more broadly as well. Eyed at 493. In light of the harmful effects of entrenched racial subordination on racial minorities in American democracy, Brown recognized the constitutional necessity of a racially integrated system of schools where education is available to all on equal terms. I bid. The desegregation cases that followed Brown confirm that the ultimate goal of that seminal decision was to achieve a system of integrated schools that ensured racial equality of opportunity, not to impose a formalistic rule of race blind N. S. In Green v. School B.D. of New Kent 391 U.S. 430, 1968, for example, the court held that the New Kent County School Board's Freedom of Choice Plan, which allegedly allowed every student, regardless of race, freely to choose the school he would attend, was insufficient to effectuate the command of Brown, Eyed at 437, 441-442. That command, the court explained, was that schools dismantle well-entrenched dual systems and transition to a unitary, non-racial system of public education. Eyed at 435-436, that the board opened the doors of the former white school to black children and the black school to white children on a race-blind basis was not enough. I'd at 437. Passively eliminating race classifications did not suffice when de facto segregation persisted. At 440 to 442, noting that 85% of black children in the school system were still attending an all-black school. Instead, the board was clearly charged with the affirmative duty to take whatever steps might be necessary to convert to a unitary system in which racial discrimination would be eliminated root and branch. I'd at 437 to 438. Affirmative steps, this court held, are constitutionally necessary when mere formal neutrality cannot achieve Brown's promise of racial equality. C. Green, 391 U.S., at 440 to 442. See also North Carolina B. of Ed v. Swan, 402 U.S. 43, 45 to 46, 1971, holding that North Carolina statute that forbade the use of race in school busing exploits an apparently neutral form to control school assignment plans by directing that they be colorblind. That requirement, against the background of segregation, would render illusory the promise of Brown. Dayton Beat of Ed v. Brinkman, 443 U.S. 5 and 26, 5 and 38, 1979, school board had to do more than abandon its prior discriminatory purpose. It had an affirmative responsibility to integrate. Keys v. School Disc No. 1, Denver, 413 and 89, 200, 1973. The state automatically assumes an affirmative duty under Brown to eliminate the vestiges of segregation. 
In so holding, this court's post-Brown decisions rejected arguments advanced by opponents of integration suggesting that restoring race as a criterion in the operation of the public schools was at odds with the Brown decisions. Brief for respondents in Green v. School B. Deed of New Kent, Kita Y. O.T. 1967, No. 695, P. 6, Green Brief. Those opponents argued that Brown only required the admission of black students to public schools on a racially non-discriminatory basis. Ided at 11, emphasis deleted. Relying on Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy, they argued that the use of race is improper because the Constitution is colorblind. Green Brief 6 and 6, quoting Plessy, 163 U.S. at 559, Harlan J. dissenting. They also incorrectly claimed that their views aligned with those of the Brown litigators, arguing that the Brown plaintiffs understood that Brown's mandate was colorblindness. Green Brief 17. This court rejected that characterization of the thrust of Brown. Green, 391 U.S. at 437. It made clear that indifference to race is not an end in itself under that watershed decision. Id at 440. The ultimate goal is racial equality of opportunity. Those rejected arguments mirror the court's opinion today. The court claims that Brown requires that students be admitted on a racially non-discriminatory basis. Ante at 13. It distorts the dissent in Plessy to advance a colorblindness theory. Ante at 38-39. See also Ante at 22. Gorsuch J. concurring. Today's decision wakes the echoes of Justice John Marshall Harlan in Plessy. Ante at 3 Thomas J. Same. The court also invokes the Brown litigators, relying on what the Brown plaintiffs had argued. Ante at 12, Ante at 35 to 36, 39 and 7, opinion of Thomas J. If there was a member of this court who understood the Brown litigation, it was Justice Thurgood Marshall, who led the litigation campaign to dismay into segregation as a civil rights lawyer and rejected the hollow, race-ignorant conception of equal protection endorsed by the court's ruling today. Brief for Nebel ACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Inc. et al., as Amici Curie 9. Justice Marshall joined the Baki plurality and applaud the judgment of the court that a university may consider race in its admissions process. 438 U.S. at 400. In fact, Justice Marshall's view was that Baka's holding should have been even more protective of race-conscious college admissions programs in light of the remedial purpose of the 14th Amendment and the legacy of racial inequality in our society. C.I.D. at 396 to 402 arguing that a class-based remedy should be constitutionally permissible in light of the hundreds of years of class-based discrimination against Black Americans. The court's recharacterization of Brown is nothing but revisionist history and an affront to the legendary life of Justice Marshall, a great jurist who was a champion of true equal opportunity, not rhetorical flourishes about colorblindness. See two decades after Brown, in Baki, a plurality of the court held that the attainment of a diverse student body is a compelling and constitutionally permissible goal for an institution of higher education. 438 U.S. At 3 and 11, 15, race could be considered in the college admissions process in pursuit of this goal, the plurality explained, if it is one factor of many in an applicant's file and each applicant receives individualized review as part of a holistic admissions process. ID at 316 to 318. Since Backey, the court has reaffirmed numerous times the constitutionality of limited race-conscious college admissions. First, in Grutter v. Bollinger, 539 U.S. 306, 2003, a majority of the court endorsed the Bach plurality's view that student body diversity is a compelling state interest that can justify the use of race in university admissions. 539 U.S. at 325, and held that race may be used in a narrowly tailored manner to achieve this interest, I'd at 333 to 344. See also Gratz v. Bollinger, 539 U.S. 244, 268, 2003. For the reasons set forth the same day in Grutter, rejecting petitioners' arguments that race can only be considered in college admissions to remedy identified discrimination, and that diversity is too open-ended, ill-defined, and indefinite to constitute a compelling interest. Later, in the Fisher litigation, the court twice reaffirmed that a limited use of race in college admissions is constitutionally permissible if it satisfies strict scrutiny. In Fisher v. 
University of Texas at Austin, 570 U.S. 297, 2013. Fisher I. Seven members of the court concluded that the use of race in college admissions comports with the 14th Amendment if it is narrowly tailored to obtain the educational benefits of diversity. Ida 314-337. Several years later, in Fisher v. University of Texas at Austin, 579 U.S. 365, 2016, Fisher II, the court upheld the admissions program at the University of Texas under this framework. ID at 380-388. Baki, Gruder, and Fisher are an extension of Brown's legacy. Those decisions recognize that experience lends support to the view that the contribution of diversity is substantial. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 324, quoting Baki, 438 U.S. at 313. Racially integrated schools improve cross-racial understanding, break down racial stereotypes, and ensure that students obtain the skills needed in today's increasingly global marketplace through exposure to widely diverse people, cultures, ideas, and viewpoints. 539 U.S. at 330. More broadly, inclusive institutions that are visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity instill public confidence in the legitimacy and integrity of those institutions and the diverse set of graduates that they cultivate, eyed at 332. That is particularly true in the context of higher education, where colleges and dirt universities play a critical role in maintaining the fabric of society and serve as the training ground for a large number of our nation's leaders. I'd at 331-332. It is thus an objective of the highest order, a compelling interest indeed, that universities pursue the benefits of racial diversity and ensure that the diffusion of knowledge and opportunity is available to students of all races. I'd at 328 to 333. This compelling interest in student body diversity is grounded not only in the court's equal protection jurisprudence, but also in principles of academic freedom, which long have been viewed as a special concern of the First Amendment. ID at 324, quoting Backey, 438 U.S. at 312. In light of the important purpose of public education, and the expansive freedoms of speech and thought associated with the university environment, this court's precedents recognize the imperative nature of diverse student bodies on American college campuses. 5 and 39 U.S. at 329. Consistent with the First Amendment, student body diversity allows universities to promote the robust exchange of ideas which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. Backey, 438 U.S. at 312, internal quotation marks omitted. Indeed, as the court recently reaffirmed in another school case, learning how to tolerate diverse expressive activities has always been part of learning how to live in a pluralistic society under our constitutional tradition. Kennedy v. Bremerton School Dist, 597 U.S. Course, 2022, slip op at 29, C.F. Koromi v. Arizona, 598 U.S. Score, 2022, Gorsuch J. Dissenting from Denial of Certiorari, Slip Op at 8. Collecting research showing that larger juries are more likely to be racially diverse and deliberate longer, recall information better, and pay greater attention to dissenting voices. In short, for more than four decades, it has been this court's settled law that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment authorizes a limited use of race in college admissions in service of the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. From Brown to Fisher, this court's cases have sought to equalize educational opportunity in a society structured by racial segregation and to advance the 14th Amendment's vision of an America where racially integrated schools guarantee students of all races the equal protection of the laws. D. Today, the court concludes that indifference to race is the only constitutionally permissible means to achieve racial equality in college admissions. That interpretation of the 14th Amendment is not only contrary to precedent and the entire teachings of our history, see Supra at 217, but is also grounded in the illusion that racial inequality was a problem of a different generation. Entrenched racial inequality remains a reality today. That is true for society writ large, and more specifically, for Harvard and the University of North Carolina, UNC, two institutions with a long history of racial exclusion. 
ignoring race will not equalize a society that is racially unequal. What was true in the 1860s and again in 1954 is true today. Equality requires acknowledgement of inequality. After more than a century of government policies enforcing racial segregation by law, society remains highly segregated. About half of all Latino and Black students attend a racially homogeneous school with at least 75% minority student enrollment. The share of intensely segregated minority schools, i.e. schools that enroll 90% to 100% racial minorities, has sharply increased. To this day, the U.S. Department of Justice continues to enter into desegregation decrees with schools that have failed to eliminate the vestiges of de jure segregation. Moreover, underrepresented minority students are more likely to live in poverty and attend schools with a high concentration of poverty. When combined, ed with residential segregation and school funding systems that rely heavily on local property taxes, this leads to racial minority students attending schools with fewer resources. See San Antonio Independent School Dist v. Rodriguez, 4 LLN U.S. 7286, 1973, Marshall J., dissenting noting school funding disparities that result from local property taxation. In turn, underrepresented minorities are more likely to attend schools with less qualified teachers, less challenging curricula, lower standardized test scores, and fewer extracurricular activities and advanced placement courses. It is thus unsurprising that there are achievement gaps along racial lines, even after controlling for income differences. Systemic inequities disadvantaging underrepresented racial minorities exist beyond school resources. Students of color, particularly black students, are disproportionately disciplined or suspended, interrupting their academic progress and increasing their risk of involvement with the criminal justice system. Underrepresented minorities are less likely to have parents with a post-secondary education who may be familiar with the college application process. Further, low-income children of color are less likely to attend preschool and other early childhood education programs that increase educational attainment. All of these interlocked factors place underrepresented minorities multiple steps behind the starting line in the race for college admissions. In North Carolina, the home of UNC, racial inequality is deeply entrenched in K-12 education. State courts have consistently found that the state does not provide underrepresented racial minorities equal access to educational opportunities, and that racial disparities in public schooling have increased in recent years in violation of the state constitution. C.E.G. Hoke C.D. Bead of Ed v. State, 2020 WL 1331241, TAR 6, and 13, Super T, Janner 21, 2020. Hoke C.I. Beat of Ed v. State, 382NC 386, 388 to 390, 893, 197 to 198, 2022. These opportunity gaps result in fewer students from underrepresented backgrounds even applying to college, particularly elite universities. Brief for Massachusetts Institute of Technology et al. as Amici Curie 32. Because talent lives everywhere, but opportunity does not, there are undoubtedly talented students with great academic potential who have simply not had the opportunity to attain the traditional indicia of merit that provide a competitive edge in the admissions process. Brief for Harvard student and alumni organizations as Amici Curie 16. Consistent with this reality, Latino and Black students are less likely to enroll in institutions of higher education than their white peers. Given the central role that education plays in breaking the cycle of racial inequality, these structural barriers reinforce other forms of inequality in communities of color. C. E. Wilson, Monopolizing Whiteness, 134 Har Rev, 2382, 24 and 16, 2021. Educational opportunities allow for social mobility, better life outcomes, and the ability to participate equally in the social and economic life of the democracy. Stark racial disparities exist, for example, in unemployment rates, income levels 17, wealth and home ownership 18, and health care access. See also Shoot v. BAMN 5572 U.S. 291 380 to 381 2014 Sotomayor J. Dissenting, noting the persistent racial inequality in society. Gratz 539 U.S. at 299 to 301 
Ginsburg J. dissenting, cataloging racial disparities in employment, poverty, health care, housing, consumer transactions, and education. Put simply, society remains inherently unequal. Brown, 347 U.S. at 495. Racial inequality runs deep to this very day. That is particularly true in education, the most vital civic institution for the preservation of a democratic system of government. Plyler v. Doe, 457 U.S. 22, 21, 223, 1982. As I have explained before, only with eyes open T, oh, this reality can the court carry out the guarantee of equal protection. Shoot, 572 U.S. at 381, dissenting opinion. 2. Both UNC and Harvard have sordid legacies of racial exclusion. Because context matters when reviewing race-conscious college admissions programs, Gruder, 539 U.S. at 327, this reality informs the exigency of respondents' current admissions policies and their racial diversity goals. For much of its history, UNC was a bastion of white supremacy. Its leadership included slaveholders, the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan, the central figures in the white supremacy campaigns of 1898 and 1900, and many of the state's most ardent defenders of Jim Crow and race-based social Darwinism in the 20th century. 3 App, 1680. The university excluded all people of color from its faculty and student body, glorified the institution of slavery, enforced its own Jim Crow regulations, and punished any dissent from racial orthodoxy. Ide at 1681 to 1683. It resisted racial integration after this court's decision in Brown and was forced to integrate by court order in 1955. 3 App 1685. It took almost 10 more years for the first black woman to enroll at the university in 1963. See Karen L. Parker Collection 1963 and 1966, UNC Wilson Special Collections Library. Even then, the university admitted only a handful of underrepresented racial minorities, and those students suffered constant harassment, humiliation, and isolation. 3 App, 1685. UNC officials openly resisted racial integration well into the 1980s, years after the youngest member of this court was born, Ided, at 1688 to 1690. During that period, black students faced racial epithets and stereotypes, received hate mail, and encountered Ku Klux Klan rallies on campus, two-eyed at 781-784, three-eyed at 1689. To this day, UNC's deep-seated legacy of racial subjugation continues to manifest itself in student life. Buildings on campus still bear the names of members of the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist leaders, eyed at 1683. Students of color also continue to experience racial harassment, isolation, and tokenism, Plus, the student body remains predominantly white. Approximately 72% of UNC students identify as white, while only 8% identify as black. Ide at 1647. These numbers do not reflect the diversity of the state, particularly black North Carolinians, who make up 22% of the population. At 1648. UNC is not alone. Harvard, like other Ivy League universities in our country, stood beside church and state as the third pillar of a civilization built on bondage. C. Wilder, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities 11, 2013. From Harvard's founding, slavery and racial subordination were integral parts of the institution's funding, intellectual production, and campus life. Harvard and its donors had extensive financial ties to, and profited from, the slave trade, the labor of enslaved people, and slavery-related investments. As Harvard now recognizes, the accumulation of this wealth was vital to the university's growth and establishment as an elite national institution. Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, Report by the President and Fellows of Harvard College 7, 2022, Harvard Report. Harvard suppressed anti-slavery views and enslaved persons, served Harvard presidents and professors, and fed and cared for Harvard students on campus. I'd at 7.15. Exclusion and discrimination continued to be a part of campus life well into the 20th century. Harvard's leadership and prominent professors openly promoted race science, racist eugenics, and other theories rooted in racial hierarchy, I'd at 11. Activities to advance these theories took place on campus, including intrusive physical examinations and photographing of unclothed students, I bid. The university also prized the admission of academically able Anglo-Saxon students from elite backgrounds, including wealthy white sons of the South, 
I'd at 44. By contrast, T, an average of three black students enrolled at Harvard each year during the five decades between 1890 and 1940, I'd at 45. Those black students who managed to enroll at Harvard excelled academically, earning equal or better academic records than most white students, but faced the challenges of the deeply rooted legacy of slavery and racism on campus, IBID. Meanwhile, a few women of color attended Radcliffe College, a separate and overwhelmingly white women's annex where racial minorities were denied campus housing and scholarships, I'd at 51. Women of color at Radcliffe were taught by Harvard professors, but women did not receive Harvard degrees until 1963. Ibid, see also S. Bradley, Appending the Ivory Tower, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Ivy League 17, 2018, noting that the historical discussion of racial integration at the Ivy League is necessarily male-centric, given the historical exclusion of women of color from these institutions. Today, benefactors with ties to slavery and white supremacy continue to be memorialized across campus through statues, buildings, professorships, student houses, and the like. Harvard Report 11. Black and Latino applicants account for only 20% of domestic applicants to Harvard each year. App to pet for cert in number 201199, P112. Even those students of color who beat the odds and earn an offer of admission continue to experience isolation and alienation on campus. Brief for 25 Harvard student and alumni organizations as Amishi Curie, 30-31, 2 App, 823-961. For years, the university has reported that inequities on campus remain. See, e.g., 4 App, 1564-1601. For example, Harvard has reported that far too many Black students at Harvard experience feelings of isolation and marginalization, 3 eyed at 1308, and that student survey data showed that only half of Harvard undergraduates believe that the housing system fosters exchanges between students of different backgrounds, ID, at 1309. These may be uncomfortable truths to some, but they are truths nonetheless. Institutions can and do change, however, as societal and legal changes force them to live up to their highest ideals. Harvard Report 56. It is against this historical backdrop that Harvard and UNC have reckoned with their past and its lingering effects. Acknowledging the reality that race has always mattered and continues to matter, these universities have established institutional goals of diversity and inclusion. Consistent with equal protection principles and this court's settled law, their policies use race in a limited way with the goal of recruiting, admitting, and enrolling underrepresented racial minorities to pursue the well-documented benefits of racial integration in education. The court today stands in the way of respondents, commendable undertaking, and entrenches racial inequality in higher education. The majority opinion does so by turning a blind eye to these truths and overruling decades of precedent, content for now to disguise its ruling as an application of established law and move on. Kennedy, 597 U.S., at Moore, Sotomayor J., dissenting, slip up at 29. As Justice Thomas puts it, Grutter is, for all intents and purposes, overruled, anti at 58. It is a disturbing feature of today's decision that the court does not even attempt to make the extraordinary showing required by stare decisis. The court simply moves the goalposts, upsetting settled expectations and throwing admissions programs nationwide into turmoil. In the end, however, it is clear why the court is forced to change the rules of the game to reach its desired outcome. Under a faithful application of the court's settled legal framework, Harvard and UNC's admissions programs are constitutional and comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 42 U.S.C., Sarashuk's 2000D at Seek. Answering the question whether Harvard's and UNC's policies survive strict scrutiny under settled law is straightforward b. Uh, because of the procedural posture of these cases and because of the narrow scope of the issues presented by Petitioner Students for Fair Admissions, Inc., SFFA. These cases arrived at this court after two lengthy trials. Harvard and UNC introduced dozens of fact witnesses, expert testimony, and documentary evidence in support of their admissions programs. Brief for Petitioner 2040. SFFA, by contrast, did not introduce a single fact witness and relied on the testimony of two experts, I bid. 
after making detailed findings of fact and conclusions of law, the district courts entered judgment in favor of Harvard and UNC. See 397F SUP 3D 26, 133-206, Harvard I, 567F SUP 3D 580, 588, 667, MDN 2021, UNC. The First Circuit affirmed in the Harvard case, finding no error in the district court's thorough opinion. 980F 3D 157, 214, 2020, Harvard II. SFFA then filed petitions for a writ of certiorari in both cases, which the court granted. 595 U.S. score 2022. The court granted certiorari on three questions. One, whether the court should overrule Backey, Grutter, and Fisher, or alternatively, two, whether UNC's admissions program is narrowly tailored, and three, whether Harvard's admissions program is narrowly tailored. See brief for petitioner in number 20 at 1199 P.I., Brief for respondent in number 201199 PI. Brief for university respondents in number 21707 PI. Answering the last two questions, which call for application of settled law to the facts of these cases, is simple. Deferring to the lower court's careful findings of fact and credibility determinations, Harvard's and UNC's policies are narrowly tailored. B1. As to narrow tailoring, the only issue SFFA raises in the UNC case is that the university cannot use race in its admissions process because race-neutral alternatives would promote UNC's diversity objectives. That issue is so easily resolved in favor of UNC that SFFA devoted only three pages to it at the end of its 87-page brief. Brief for Petitioner 8386. The use of race is narrowly tailored unless workable and available race-neutral approaches exist meaning race-neutral alternatives promote the institution's diversity goals and do so at tolerable administrative expense. Fisher was 570 U.S. at 312, quoting Weigand v. Jackson B. DeVed, 476 U.S. 267 280 and 6, 1986, plurality opinion. Narrow tailoring does not mean perfect tailoring. The court's precedents make clear that narrow tailoring does not require exhaustion of every conceivable race-neutral alternative. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 339. Nor does it require a university to choose between maintaining a reputation for excellence or fulfilling a commitment to provide educational opportunities to members of all racial groups. I bid. As the district court found after considering extensive expert testimony, SFFA's proposed race-neutral alternatives do not meet those criteria. UNC, 5 and 67 F SUP 3D at 648. All of SFFA's proposals are methodologically flawed because they rest on terribly unrealistic assumptions about the applicant pools. I'd at 643 to 645, 6 of 47. For example, as to one set of proposals, SFFA's expert unrealistically assumed that all of the top students in the candidate pools he used would apply, be admitted, and enroll. I'd at 647. In addition, some of SFFA's proposals force UNC to abandon its holistic approach to college admissions, at 643 to 645 and 43, a result in deep tension with the goal of educational diversity as this court's cases have defined it. Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 386, 387. Others are largely impractical, not to mention unprecedented in higher education. 567 F sub 3B at 647. SFFA's proposed top percentage plans, for example, are based on a made-up and complicated admissions index that requires UNC to access real-time data for all high school students. IBID, UNC is then supposed to use that index, which would change every time any student took a standardized ta test to rank students based on grades and test scores. IBID, one of SFFA's top percentage plans would even nearly erase the Native American incoming class at UNC, IBID at 646. The courts below correctly concluded that UNC is not required to adopt SFA's unrealistic proposals to satisfy strict scrutiny. To Harvard's admissions program is also narrowly tailored under settled law. SFFA argues that Harvard's program is not narrowly tailored because the university has workable race-neutral alternatives, does not use race as a mere plus, and engages in racial balancing. Brief for Petitioner 7583. As the First Circuit concluded, there was no error in the district court's findings on any of these issues. Harvard 2, 980F3D at 204. Like UNC, Harvard has already implemented many of SFA's proposals, such as increasing recruitment efforts and financial aid for low-income students. 
Ide at 193. Also like UNC, Harvard carefully considered other race-neutral ways to achieve its diversity goals, but none of them are workable. Ide at 193-194. SFFA's argument before this court is that Harvard should adopt a plan designed by SFA's expert for purposes of trial, which increases preferences for low-income applicants and eliminates the use of race and legacy preferences. Ide at 193, brief for petitioner 81. Under SFFA's model, however, Black representation would plummet by about 32%, and the admitted share of applicants with high academic ratings would decrease, as would the share with high extracurricular and athletic ratings, 980F3D at 194. SFFA's proposal, echoed by Justice Gorsuch, ante, at 14 to 15, requires Harvard to make sacrifices on almost every dimension important to its admissions process. 980F3D at 194, and forces it to choose between a diverse student body and a reputation for academic excellence, Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 385. Neither this court's precedents nor common sense impose that type of burden on colleges and universities. The courts below also properly rejected SFFA's argument that Harvard does not use race in the limited way this court's precedents allow. The court has explained that a university can consider a student's race in its admissions process so long as that use is contextual and does not operate as a mechanical plus factor. I did at 375. The court has also repeatedly held that race, when considered as one factor of many in the context of holistic review, can make a difference to whether an application is accepted or rejected. A bid. After all, race-conscious admissions seek to improve racial diversity. Race cannot, however, be decisive for virtually every minimally qualified underrepresented minority applicant. Gratz, 539 U.S. at 272, quoting Bakke, 438 U.S. at 317. That is precisely how Harvard's program operates. In recent years, Harvard has received about 35,000 applications for a class with about 1,600 seats. 980F, 3D at 165. The admissions process is exceedingly competitive. It involves six different application components. Those components include interviews with alumni and admissions officers, as well as consideration of a whole range of information, such as grades, test scores, recommendation letters, and personal essays by several committees. I'd at 165 to 166. Consistent with that individualized holistic review process, admissions officers may but need not consider a student's self-reported racial identity when assigning overall ratings. ID at 166, 169, 180. Even after so many layers of competitive review, Harvard typically ends up with about 2,000 tentative admits, more students than the 1,600 or so that the university can admit. ID at 170. To choose among those highly qualified candidates, Harvard considers plus factors which can help tip an applicant into Harvard's admitted class at 170, 191. To diversify its class, Harvard awards tips for a variety of reasons, including geographic factors, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, and RLE, ACE, IBID. There is no evidence of any mechanical use of tips, ID at 180. Consistent with the court's precedents, Harvard properly considers race as part of a holistic review process, values all types of diversity, does not consider race exclusively, and does not award a fixed amount of points to applicants because of their race. ID at 190. Indeed, Harvard's admissions process is so competitive, and the use of race is so limited and flexible that, as SFFA's own experts analysis showed, Harvard rejects more than two-thirds of Hispanic applicants and slightly less than half of all African-American applicants who are among the top 10% most academically promising applicants. ID at 191. The courts below correctly rejected SFFA's view that Harvard's use of race is unconstitutional because it impaired all Hispanic and Black student representation by 45%. See brief for Petitioner 79. That 45% figure shows that eliminating the use of race in admissions would reduce African American representation from 14% to 6% and Hispanic representation from 14% to 9%. Harvard 2, 980F3D at 180, 191. Such impact of Harvard's limited use of race on the makeup of the class is less than this court has previously upheld as narrowly tailored. 
In Gruder, for example, eliminating the use of race would have reduced the underrepresented minority population by 72%, a much greater effect. 539 U.S. at 320. And in Fisher too, the use of race helped increase Hispanic representation from 11% to 16.9%, a 54% increase. And African American representation from 3.5% to 6.8%, a 94% increase. 579 U.S. at 384. Finally, the courts below correctly concluded that Harvard complies with this court's repeated admonition that colleges and universities cannot define their diversity interest as some specified percentage of a particular group merely because of its race or ethnic origin. Fisher was, 570 U.S. at 311, quoting Backe, 438 U.S. at 307. Harvard does not specify its diversity objectives in terms of racial quotas, and SFFA did not offer expert testimony to support its racial balancing claim. Harvard 2, 980F3D at 180, 186-187. Harvard's statistical evidence, by contrast, showed that the admitted classes across racial groups varied considerably year to year, a pattern inconsistent with the imposition of a racial quota or racial balancing. Harvard 1, 397, FSUP, 3 at 176 to 177. See Harvard 2, 980F3D at 180, 188 to 189. Similarly, Harvard's use of one-pagers containing a snapshot of various demographic characteristics of Harvard's applicant pool during the admissions review process is perfectly consistent with this court's precedence. I'd. At 170-171, 189. Consultation of these reports with no specific number firmly in mind does not transform Harvard's program into a quota. Gruder, 5 of 39 U.S. at 335 to 336. Rather, Harvard's ongoing review complies with the court's command that universities periodically review the necessity of the use of race in their admissions programs. Ide at 342, Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 388. The court ignores these careful findings and concludes that Harvard engages in racial balancing because its focus on numbers is obvious. Anti at 31. Because SFFA failed to offer an expert and to prove its claim below, the majority is forced to reconstruct the record and conduct its own factual analysis. It thus relies on a single chart from SFFA's brief that truncates relevant data in the record. Compare I bid. Citing brief for petitioner in number high, 20 to 1199 P23, with 4 app in number 20 1199 P1770. That chart cannot displace the careful fact finding by the district court which the First Circuit upheld on appeal under clear error review. See Harvard 2, 980F3D at 180-182, 188-189. In any event, the chart is misleading and ignores the broader context of the underlying data that it purports to summarize. I'd at 188. As the First Circuit concluded, what the data actually show is that ad missions have increased for all racial minorities, including Asian American students, whose admissions numbers have increased roughly five-fold since 1980 and roughly two-fold since 1990. I'd at 180, 188. The data also show that the racial shares of admitted applicants fluctuate more than the corresponding racial shares of total applicants, which is the opposite of what one would expect if Harvard imposed a quota. At 188. Even looking at the court's truncated period for the classes of 2009 to 2018, the same pattern holds. IBID. The fact that Harvard's racial shares of admitted applicants varies relatively little in absolute terms for those classes is unsurprising and reflects the fact that the racial makeup of Harvard's applicant pool also varies very little over this period. I'd at 188 to 189. Thus, properly understood, the data show that Harvard does not utilize quotas and does not engage in racial balancing at 189. Three, the court concludes that Harvard's and UNC's policies are unconstitutional because they serve objectives that are insufficiently measurable, employ racial categories that are imprecise and overbroad, rely on racial stereotypes and disadvantage non-minority groups, and do not have an endpoint. Anti at 2134-39. In reaching this conclusion, the court claims those supposed issues with respondents' programs render the programs insufficiently narrow under the strict scrutiny framework that the court's precedents command. Anti at 22. 
In reality, however, the court today cuts through the kudzu and overrules its higher education precedents following Baki. Ante, at 22, Gorsuch J. Concurring. There is no better evidence that the court is overruling the court's precedents than those precedents themselves. Every one of the arguments made by the majority can be found in the dissenting opinions filed in the cases the majority now overrules. Payne v. Tennessee, 501 U.S. 808 46, 1991. Marshall J. Dissenting, C. E. G. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 354, Thomas J., concurring in part and dissenting in part. Unlike the majority, I seek to define with precision the interest being asserted. Fisher II, 579 U.S. at 389, Thomas J. Dissenting, race-conscious admissions programs rest on pernicious assumptions about race. Ide at 403, Alito J., joined by Robert C. J. and Thomas J. Dissenting, Diversity interests are laudable goals, but they are not concrete or precise. At 413, race-conscious college admissions plan discriminates against Asian American students. ID. At 414, race-conscious admissions plan is unconstitutional because it does not specify what it means to be African American, Hispanic, Asian American, Native American, or white. ID. At 419, race-conscious college admissions policies rest on pernicious stereotypes. Lost arguments are not grounds to overrule a case. When proponents of those arguments, greater now in number on the court, return to fight old battles anew, it betrays an unrestrained disregard for precedent. It fosters the people's suspicions that bedrock principles are founded in the proclivities of individuals on this court, not in the law, and it degrades the integrity of our constitutional system of government. Vasquez v. Hillary, 474 U.S. 254, 265, 1986. Nowhere is the damage greater than in cases like these that touch upon matters of representation and institutional legitimacy. The court offers no justification, much less a special justification, for its costly endeavor. Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, 597 U.S. Corps 2022, Joint Opinion of Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, J.J. Dissenting, Slip Up at 31, quoting Gamble v. United States, 587 U.S. 2019, slip up at 11. Nor could it. There is no basis for overruling Bakke, Grutter, and Fisher. The court's precedents were correctly decided. The opinion today is not workable and creates serious equal protection problem. MSS, important reliance interests favor respondents, and there are no legal or factual developments favoring the court's reckless course. See 597 U.S. at Nor. Joint opinion of Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, J.J. dissenting, slip op at 31. I.D., Kavanaugh, J. concurring, slip op at 6 to 7. At bottom, the six unelected members of today's majority upend the status quo based on their policy preferences about what race in America should be like, but is not, and their preferences for a veneer of colorblindness in a society where race has always mattered and continues to matter in fact and in law. A one. A limited use of race in college admissions is consistent with the 14th Amendment and this Court's broader equal protection jurisprudence. The text and history of the 14th Amendment make clear that the Equal Protection Clause permits race-conscious measures. See Supra at 2-9. Consistent with that view, the Court has explicitly held that race-based action is sometimes within constitutional constraints. Adaran Constructors, Inc. v. Pena, 5 and 15 U.S. 200 237, 1995. The court has thus upheld the use of race in a variety of contexts. C.E.G. Parents Involved in Community Schools v. Seattle School Dist No. 1, 551 U.S. 701, 737, 2007. The obligation to disestablish a school system segregated by law can include race-conscious remedies, whether or not a court had issued an order to that effect. Johnson v. California, 543 U.S. 499 512, 2005. Use of race permissible to further prison's interest in security and discipline. Cooper v. Harris, 581 U.S. 285, 291 to 293, 2017. Use of race permissible when drawing voting districts in some circumstances. Tellingly, in sharp contrast with today's decision, the court has allowed the use of race when that use burdens minority populations. In United States v. Brignoni Ponzi, 422 U.S. 873, 1975, for example, 
the court held that it is unconstitutional for Border Patrol agents to rely on a person's skin color as a single factor to justify a traffic stop based on reasonable suspicion, but it remarked that Mexican appearance could be a relevant factor out of many to justify such a stop at the border and its functional equivalents. I'd at 884-87, see also I'd at 882, recognizing that the border includes entire metropolitan areas such as San Diego, El Paso, and the South Texas Rio Grande Valley. The court thus facilitated racial profiling of Latinos as a law enforcement tool and did not adopt a race-blind rule. The court later extended this reasoning to Border Patrol agents selectively referring motorists for secondary inspection at a checkpoint, concluding that, even if it be assumed that such referrals are made largely on the basis of apparent Mexican ancestry, there is no constitutional violation. United States v. Martinez Forte, 428 U.S., 543, 562 to 563, 1976, footnote omitted. The result of today's decision is that a person's skin color may play a role in assessing individualized suspicion, but it cannot play a role in assessing that person's individualized contributions to a diverse learning environment. That indefensible reading of the Constitution is not grounded in law and subverts the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. Two, the majority does not dispute that some uses of race are constitutionally permissible. See Ante at 15. Indeed, it agrees that a limited use of race is permissible in some college admissions programs. In a footnote, the court exempts military academies from its ruling in light of the potentially distinct interests they may present. Ante at 22 and 4. To the extent the court suggests national security interests are distinct, those interests cannot explain the court's narrow exemption, as national security interests are also implicated at civilian universities. See Infra at 64 to 65. The court also attempts to justify its carve-out based on the fact that no military academy is a party to these cases, ante at 22 and 4. Yet the same can be said of many other institutions that are not parties here, including the religious universities supporting respondents, which the court does not similarly exempt from its sweeping opinion. See Brief for Georgetown University et al. as Amici Curia 18 to 29, Georgetown Brief. Catholic colleges and universities noting that they rely on the use of race in their holistic admissions to further not just their academic goals, but also their religious missions. See also Harvard 2, 980F3D at 187N24. As schools that consider race are diverse on numerous dimensions, including in terms of religious affiliation, location, size, and courses of study offered. The court's carve-out only highlights the arbitrariness of its decision and further proves that the 14th Amendment does not categorically prohibit the use of race in college admissions. The concurring opinions also agree that the Constitution tolerates some racial classifications. Justice Gorsuch agrees with the majority's conclusion that racial classifications are constitutionally permissible if they advance a compelling interest in a narrowly tailored way. Ante at 23. Justice Kavanaugh, too, agrees that the Constitution permits the use of race if it survives strict scrutiny. Ante at 2. Justice Thomas offers an originalist defense of the colorblind Constitution, but his historical analysis leads to the inevitable conclusion that the Constitution is not, in fact, colorblind. Ante at 2. Like the majority opinion, Justice Thomas agrees that race can be used to remedy past discrimination and to equalize treatment against a concrete baseline of government-imposed inequality. Ante at 1821. He also argues that race can be used if it satisfies strict scrutiny more broadly, and he considers compelling interests those that prevent anarchy, curb violence, and segregate prisoners. Ante at 26. Thus, although Justice Thomas at times suggests that the Constitution only permits directly remedial measures that benefit identified victims of discrimination, ante at 20, he agrees that the Constitution tolerates a much wider range of race-conscious measures. In the end, when the court speaks of a colorblind Constitution, it cannot really mean it, for it is faced with a body of law that recognizes that race-conscious measures are permissible under the Equal Protection Clause. Instead, what the court actually lands on is an understanding of the Constitution that is colorblind sometimes, when the court so chooses. 
Behind those choices lie the court's own value judgments about what type of interests are sufficiently compelling to justify race-conscious measures. Overruling decades of precedent, today's newly constituted court singles out the limited use of race in holistic college admissions. It strikes at the heart of Bakke, Grutter, and Fisher by holding that racial diversity is an inescapably imponderable objective that cannot justify race-conscious affirmative action, anti at 24, even though respondents' objectives simply mirror the compelling interest this court has approved many times in the past. Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 382, C.E.G., U.N.C., 567 F. Sup. at 598, the university's admissions policy repeatedly cites Supreme Court precedent as guideposts. At bottom, without any new factual or legal justification, the court overrides its long-standing holding that diversity in higher education is of compelling value. To avoid public accountability for its choice, the court seeks cover behind a unique measurability requirement of its own creation. None of this court's precedents, however, requires that a compelling interest meet some threshold level of precision to be deemed sufficiently compelling. In fact, this court has recognized as compelling plenty of interests that are equally or more amorphous, including the intangible interest in preserving public confidence in judicial integrity, and in terrace that does not easily reduce to precise definition. Williams Uli v. Florida Bar, 575 U.S. 433, 447, 4, 2015, Robert C.J. for the court. See also E.G. Ramirez v. Collier, 595 U.S. 2022, Robert C.J. for the court, slip op at 18. Maintaining solemnity and decorum in the execution chamber is a compelling interest. United States v. Alvarez, 567 U.S. 709, 725, 2012, plurality opinion. Protecting the integrity of the Medal of Honor is a compelling interest. Sable Communications of Cal, Inc. v. FCC, 492 U.S. 115, 126, 1989. Protecting the physical and psychological well-being of minors is a compelling interest. Thus, although the members of this majority pay lip service to respondents' commendable and worthy racial diversity goals, anti, at 23-24, they make a clear value judgment today. Racial integration in higher education is not sufficiently important to them. Today, the proclivities of individuals rule. Dobbs, 597 U.S. at Snore, dissenting opinion, slip op at 6. The majority offers no response to any of this. Instead, it attacks a straw man, arguing that the court's cases recognize that remedying the effects of societal discrimination does not constitute a compelling interest. Ante at 34 to 35. Yet, as the majority acknowledges, while Bakke rejected that interest as insufficiently compelling, it upheld a limited use of race in college admissions to promote the educational benefits that flow from diversity. 438 U.S. at 311-315. It is that narrower interest which the court has reaffirmed numerous times since Bakke and as recently as 2016 in Fisher II, C. Supra, at 14-15, that the court overrules today. B the court's precedents authorizing a limited use of race in college admissions are not just workable. They have been working. Lower courts have consistently applied them without issue, as exemplified by the opinions below and SFFAs and the court's inability to identify any split of authority. Today, the court replaces this settled framework with a set of novel restraints that create troubling equal protection problems and share one common purpose— to make it impossible to use race in a holistic way in college admissions, where it is much needed. The court argues that Harvard's and UNC's programs must end because they unfairly disadvantage some racial groups. According to the court, college admissions are a zero-sum game and respondents' use of race unfairly advantages underrepresented minority students at the expense of other students. Anti at 27. That is not the role race plays in holistic admissions. Consistent with the court's precedents, respondents' holistic review policies consider race in a very limited way. Race is only one factor out of many. That type of system allows Harvard and UNC to assemble a diverse class on a multitude of dimensions. Respondents' policies allow them to select students with various unique attributes, including talented athletes, artists, scientists, and musicians. 
They also allow respondents to assemble a class with diverse viewpoints, including students who have different political ideologies and academic interests, who have struggled with different types of disabilities, who are from various socioeconomic backgrounds, who understand different ways of life in various parts of the country, and yes, students who self-identify with various racial backgrounds and who can offer different perspectives because of that identity. That type of multidimensional system benefits all students. In fact, racial groups that are not underrepresented tend to benefit disproportionately from such a system. Harvard's holistic system, for example, provides points to applicants who qualify as ALDC, meaning athletes, legacy applicants, applicants on the dean's interest list, primarily relatives of donors, and children of faculty or staff. Harvard 2, 980F3D at 171, noting also that SFFA does not challenge the admission of this CAP large group. ALDC applicants are predominantly white. Around 67.8% are white, 11.4% are Asian American, 6% are black, and 5.6% are Latino. IBID. By contrast, only 40.3% of non-ALDC applicants are white, 28.3% are Asian American, 11% are black, and 12.6% are Latino. IBID. Although ALDC applicants make up less than 5% of applicants to Harvard, they constitute around 30% of the applicants admitted each year. IBID. Similarly, because of achievement gaps that result from entrenched racial inequality in K-12 education, see infra at 18 to 21, a heavy emphasis on grades and standardized test scores disproportionately disadvantages underrepresented racial minorities. Stated simply, race is one small piece of a much larger admissions puzzle where most of the pieces disfavor underrepresented racial minorities. That is precisely why underrepresented racial minorities remain underrepresented. The court's suggestion that an already advantaged racial group is disadvantaged because of a limited use of race is a myth. The majority's true objection appears to be that a limited use of race in college admissions does in fact achieve what it is designed to achieve. It helps equalize opportunity and advances respondents' objectives by increasing the number of underrepresented racial minorities on college campuses, particularly Black and Latino students. This is unacceptable, the court says, because racial groups that are not underrepresented would be admitted in greater numbers without these policies. Ante at 28. Reduced to its simplest terms, the court's conclusion is that an increase in the representation of racial minorities at institutions of higher learning that were historically reserved for white Americans is an unfair and repugnant outcome that offends the Equal Protection Clause. It provides a license to discriminate against white Americans, the court says, which requires the courts and state actors to pick the right races to benefit. Ante at 38. Nothing in the 14th Amendment or its history supports the court's shocking proposition, which echoes arguments made by opponents of Reconstruction-era laws and this court's decision in Brown. Supra at 217. In a society where opportunity is dispensed along racial lines, racial equality cannot be achieved without making room for underrepresented groups that for far too long were denied admission through the force of law, including at Harvard and UNC. Quite the opposite. A racially integrated vision of society in which institutions reflect all sectors of the American public and where the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners are able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood is precisely what the Equal Protection Clause commands. Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech, August 28, 1963. It is essential if the dream of one nation indivisible is to be realized. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 332. By singling out race, the court imposes a special burden on racial minorities for whom race is a crucial component of their identity. Holistic admissions require truly individualized consideration of the whole person. Ide at 334. Yet, by foreclosing racial considerations, colorblindness denies those who racially self-identify the full expression of their identity and treats racial identity as inferior among all other forms of social identity. E-Body, The Indignities of Colorblindness, 64 UCLA L. Rev. Discourse, 64, 67, 2016. The court's approach thus turns the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee on its head and creates an equal protection problem of its own. 
there is no question that minority students will bear the burden of today's decision. Students of color testified at trial that racial self-identification was an important component of their application because without it, they would not be able to present a full version of themselves. For example, Ramel Mwamba, a black UNC alumna, testified that it was really important that UNC see who she is holistically and how the color of her skin and the texture of her hair impacted her upbringing. Two app in number 2177 P. Then 33. It's El Vasquez Rodriguez, who identifies as Mexican American of Cora descent, testified that her ethno racial identity is a core piece of who she is and has impacted every experience she has had, such that she could not explain her potential contributions to Harvard without any reference to it. Two app in number 2199 at 906 908. Sally Chen, a Harvard alumna who identifies as Chinese-American, explained that being the child of Chinese immigrants was really fundamental to explaining who she is, I'd at 968-969. Thang Deep, a Harvard alumnus, testified that his Vietnamese identity was such a big part of himself that he needed to discuss it in his application, ID at 949. And Sarah Cole, a black Harvard alumna, emphasized that to try to not see her race is to try to not see her simply because there is no part of her experience, no part of her journey, no part of her life that has been untouched by her race. I'd at 9.32. In a single paragraph at the end of its lengthy opinion, the court suggests that nothing in today's opinion prohibits universities from considering a student's essay that explains how race affected that student's life. Ante at 39. This supposed recognition that universities can, in some situations, consider race in application essays is nothing but an attempt to put lipstick on a pig. The court's opinion circumscribes universities' ability to consider race in any form by meticulously gutting respondents' asserted diversity interests. See Supra at 41 to 43. Yet, because the court cannot escape the inevitable truth that race matters in students' lives, it announces a false promise to save face and appear attuned to reality no one is fooled. Further, the courts demand that a student's discussion of racial self-identification be tied to individual qualities, such as courage, leadership, unique ability, and determination, only serves to perpetuate the false narrative that Harvard and UNC currently provide preferences on the basis of race alone. Anti at 28 to 29, 39, see also anti at 28 N. 6, claiming without support that race alone explains the admissions decisions for hundreds, if not thousands, of applicants. The court's precedents already require that universities take race into account holistically, in a limited way, and based on the type of individualized and flexible assessment that the court purports to favor. Grutter, 539 U.S. at 334. See Brief for Students and Alumni of Harvard College as Amitsi Curia 15-17, to Harvard College Brief describing how the dozens of application files in the record uniformly show that, in line with Harvard's whole-person admissions philosophy, Harvard's admissions officers engage in a highly nuanced assessment of each applicant's background and qualifications. After extensive discovery and two lengthy trials, neither SFFA nor the majority can point to a single example of an underrepresented racial minority who was admitted to Harvard or UNC on the basis of race alone. In the end, the court merely imposes its preferred college application format on the nation, not acting as a court of law, applying precedent, but taking on the role of college administrators to decide what is better for society. The court's course reflects its inability to recognize that racial identity informs some students' viewpoints and experiences in unique ways. The court goes as far as to claim that Baca's recognition that Black Americans can offer different perspectives than white people amounts to a stereotype, anti at 29. It is not a stereotype to acknowledge the basic truth that young people's experiences are shaded by a societal structure where race matters. Acknowledging that there is something special about a student of color who graduates valedictorian from a predominantly white SK, Ewell is not a stereotype, nor is it a stereotype to acknowledge that race imposes certain burdens on students of color that it does not impose on white students. For generations, black and brown parents have given their children the talk, instructing them never to run down the street 
always keep your hands where they can be seen. Do not even think of talking back to a stranger, all out of fear of how an officer with a gun will react to them. Utah v. Streif, 579 U.S. 232-254, 2016, Sotomayor J. Dissenting. Those conversations occur regardless of socioeconomic background or any other aspect of a student's self-identification. They occur because of race. As Andrew Brennan, a UNC alumnus, testified, running down the neighborhood, people don't see him as someone that is relatively affluent. They see him as a black man. Two app in her 21707 at 951 to 952. The absence of racial diversity, by contrast, actually contributes to stereotyping. D. Diminishing the force of such stereotypes is both a crucial part of respondents' mission and one that they cannot accomplish with only token numbers of minority students. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 333. When there is an increase in underrepresented minority students on campus, racial stereotypes lose their force. Because diversity allows students to learn there is no minority viewpoint, but rather a variety of viewpoints among minority students. ID at 319 to 320. By preventing respondents from achieving their diversity objectives, it is the court's opinion that facilitates stereotyping on American college campuses. To be clear, today's decision leaves intact holistic college admissions and recruitment efforts that seek to enroll diverse classes without using racial classifications. Universities should continue to use those tools as best they can to recruit and admit students from different backgrounds based on all the other factors the court's opinion does not and cannot touch. Colleges and universities can continue to consider socioeconomic diversity and to recruit and enroll students who are first-generation college applicants or who speak multiple languages, for example. Those factors are not interchangeable with race. UNC 5567 F SUP at 643, CEG 2 app in number 21707 at 975 and 976, Laura Ornelas, a UNC alumna, testifying that her Latina identity, socioeconomic status, and first-generation college status are all important, but different parts to getting a full picture of who she is and how she sees the world. At SFFA's own urging, those efforts remain constitutionally permissible. See brief for Petitioner 8186, emphasizing race-neutral alternatives that Harvard and UNC should implement, such as those that focus on socioeconomic and geographic diversity, percentage plans, plans that increase community college transfers, and plans that develop partnerships with disadvantaged high schools. See also Anti at 51, 53, 55 to 56, Thomas J. Concurring arguing universities can consider race-neutral policies similar to those adopted in states such as California and Michigan, and that universities can consider status as a first-generation college applicant, financial means, and generational inheritance or otherwise, anti Kavanaugh J. concurring. Citing SFFA's briefs and concluding that universities can use race-neutral means, anti at 14 and 4, Gorsuch J. concurring, recounting what SFFA has argued every step of the way as to race-neutral tools. The court today also does not adopt SFFA's suggestion that college admissions should be a function of academic metrics alone, using class rank or standardized test scores as the only admissions criteria would severely undermine multidimensional diversity in higher education. Such a system would exclude the star athlete or musician whose grades suffered because of daily practices and training. It would exclude a talented young biologist who struggled to maintain above average grades I and humanities classes. And it would exclude a student whose freshman year grades were poor because of a family crisis, but who got herself back on track in her last three years of school, only to find herself just outside of the top decile of her class. Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 386. A myopic focus on academic ratings does not lead to a diverse student body. 2. As noted above, this court suggests that the use of race in college admissions is unworkable because respondents' objectives are not sufficiently measurable, focused, concrete, and coherent. Ante at 2326-39. How much more precision is required or how universities are supposed to meet the court's measurability requirement, the court's opinion does not say. That is exactly the point. The court is not interested in crafting a workable framework that promotes racial diversity on college campuses. Instead, 
it announces a requirement designed to ensure all race-conscious plans fail. Any increased level of precision runs the risk of violating the court's admonition that colleges and universities operate their race-conscious admissions policies with no specified percentage and no specific numbers firmly in mind. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 324, 335. Thus, the majority's holding puts schools in an untenable position. It creates a legal framework where race-conscious plans must be measured with precision but also must not be measured with precision. That holding is not meant to infuse clarity into the strict scrutiny framework. It is designed to render strict scrutiny fatal in fact. Eid at 326, quoting Adirond Constructors, Inc., 515 U.S. at 237. Indeed, the court gives the game away when it holds that, to the extent respondents are actually measuring their diversity objectives with any level of specificity, for example, with a focus on numbers or specific numerical commitment, their plans are unconstitutional. Ante at 3031. See also Ante at 29. Thomas J. Concurring. I highly doubt any university will be able to show a measurable state interest. Three, the court also holds that Harvard's and UNC's race-conscious programs are unconstitutional because they rely on racial categories that are imprecise, opaque, and arbitrary. Ante at 25. To start, the racial categories that the court finds troubling resemble those used across the federal government for data collection, compliance reporting, and program administration purposes, including, for example, by the U.S. Census Bureau, CEG 62 Fed Reg 58786-58790-1997. Surely not all federal grant and aid benefits, drafting of legislation, urban and regional planning, business planning, and academic and social studies that flow from Census Data Collection, Department of Commerce v. New York, 588 U.S. Gummer Score, 2019, slip op at 2, are constitutionally suspect. The majority presumes that it knows better and appoints itself as an expert on data collection methods, calling for a higher level of granularity to fix a supposed problem of over-inclusiveness and under-inclusiveness. Yet it does not identify a single instance where respondents' methodology has prevented any student from reporting their race with the level of detail they preferred. The record shows that it is up to students to choose whether to identify as one, multiple, or none of these categories. See Harvard and 397 F SUP 3D at 137, UNC 567 F SUP 3D at 596. To the extent students need to convey additional information, students can select subcategories or provide more detail in their personal statements or essays. See Harvard 1 397 F SUP 3D at 137. Students often do so. See SUP so app in number 2011-99 at 906-907, student respondent discussing her Latina identity on her application. ID at 949 student respondent testifying he wrote about his Vietnamese identity on his application. Notwithstanding this court's confusion about racial self-identification, neither students nor university, as are confused. There is no evidence that the racial categories that respondents use are unworkable. For cherry-picking language from Gruder, the court also holds that Harvard's and UNC's race-conscious programs are unconstitutional because they do not have a specific expiration date. Ante at 30 to 34. This new durational requirement is also not grounded in law, facts, or common sense. Gruder simply announced a general expectation that the use of racial preferences would no longer be necessary in the future. 5 and 39 U.S. at 343. As even SFA acknowledges, those remarks were nothing but aspirational statements by the Grutter Court. TR of Oral Arg in number 21 to 707 P56. Yet this court suggests that everyone, including the court itself, has been misreading Grutter for 20 years. Grutter, according to the majority, requires that universities identify a specific endpoint for the use of race. Ante at 33. Justice Kavanaugh, for his part, suggests that Grutter itself automatically expires in 25 years after either the college class of 2028 or the college class of 2032. Ante at 7 and 1. A faithful reading of this court's precedents reveals that Grutter held nothing of the sort. True, Grutter referred to 25 years, but that arbitrary number simply reflected the time that had elapsed since the court first approved the use of race in college admissions in Bakke. 
Grutter, 539 U.S. at 343. It is also true that Grutter remarked that race-conscious admissions policies must be limited in time, but it did not do so in a vacuum, as the court suggests, eyed at 342. Rather than impose a fixed expiration date, the court tasked universities with the responsibility of periodically assessing whether their race-conscious programs are still necessary. I bid. Grutter offered as examples sunset provisions, periodic reviews, and experimenting with race-neutral alternatives as they develop. I bid. That is precisely how this court has previously interpreted Grutter's command. See Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 388. It is the university's ongoing obligation to engage in constant deliberation and continued reflection regarding its admissions policies. Grutter's requirement that universities engage in periodic reviews so the use of race can end as soon as practicable is well grounded in the need to ensure that race is employed no more broadly than the interest demands. 539 U.S. at 343. That is, it is grounded in strict scrutiny. By contrast, the court's holding is based on the fiction that racial inequality has a predictable cutoff date. Equality is an ongoing project in a society where racial inequality persists. See Supra at 17 to 25. A temporal requirement that rests on the fantasy that racial inequality will end at a predictable hour is illogical and unworkable. There is a sound reason why this court's precedents have never imposed the majority's strict deadline institutions cannot predict the future. Speculating about a day when consideration of race will become unnecessary is arbitrary at best and frivolous at worst. There is no constitutional duty to engage in that type of shallow guesswork. Harvard and UNC engage in the ongoing review that the court's precedents demand. They use their data to scrutinize the fairness of their admissions programs, to assess whether changing demographics have undermined the need for a race-conscious policy and to identify the effects, both positive and negative, of the affirmative action measures they deem necessary. Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 388. The court holds, however, that respondents' attention to numbers amounts to unconstitutional racial balancing, anti at 3032. But some attention to numbers is both necessary and permissible. Grutter, 539 U.S. at 336, quoting back 438 U.S. at 323. Universities cannot blindly operate their limited race-conscious programs without regard for any quantitative information. Increasing minority enrollment is instrumental to e. educational benefits that respondents seek to achieve, Fisher 2, 579 U.S. at 381, and statistics, data, and numbers have some value as a gauge of respondents' ability to enroll students who can offer underrepresented perspectives, ID, at 383-384. By removing universities' ability to assess the success of their programs, the court obstructs these institutions' ability to meet their diversity goals. Five Justice Thomas, for his part, offers a multitude of arguments for why race-conscious college admissions policies supposedly burden racial minorities. Ante at 39. None of them has any merit. He first renews his argument that the use of race in holistic admissions leads to the inevitable underperformance by Black and Latino students at elite universities because they are less academically prepared than the white and Asian students with whom they must compete. Fisher 1, 570 U.S., at 332, concurring opinion. Justice Thomas speaks only for himself. The court previously declined to adopt this so-called mismatch hypothesis for good reason. It was debunked long ago. The decades-old studies advanced by the handful of authors upon whom Justice Thomas relies, anti at 4041, have major methodological flaws, are based on unreliable data, and do not meet the basic tenets of rigorous social science research. Brief for empirical scholars as Amishi Curie, 3, 9-25. By contrast, many social scientists have studied the impact of elite educational institutions on student outcomes and have found, among other things, that attending a more selective school is associated with higher graduation rates and higher earnings for underrepresented minority students. Conclusions directly contrary to mismatch. I'd, at 7 to 9, collecting studies. This extensive body of research is supported by the most obvious data point available to this institution today. 
the three justices of color on this court graduated from elite universities and law schools with race-conscious admissions programs and achieved successful legal careers, despite having different educational backgrounds than their peers. A discredited hypothesis that the court previously rejected is no reason to overrule precedent. Justice Thomas claims that the weight of this evidence is overcome by a single more recent article published in 2016, Anti at 41 and 8. That article, however, explains that studies supporting the mismatch hypothesis yield misleading conclusions, overstate the amount of mismatch, preclude one from drawing any concrete conclusions, and rely on methodologically flawed assumptions that lead to an upwardly biased estimate of mismatch. P. R. Sidiakono and M. Lovenheim, Affirmative Action and the Quality Fit Trade-Off, 54 J. Econ 3, 17, 20, 2016, C. I. D. at 6, economists should be very skeptical of the mismatch hypothesis. Notably, this refutation of the mismatch theory was co-authored by one of SFFA's experts, as Justice Thomas seems to recognize. Citing nothing but his own long-held belief, Justice Thomas also equates affirmative action in higher education with segregation, arguing that racial preferences in college admissions stamp Black and Latino students with a badge of inferiority. Anti at 41, quoting Adirand, 515 U.S. at 241, Thomas J., concurring in part and concurring in judgment, studies disprove this sentiment, which echoes tropes of stigma that were employed to oppose Reconstruction policies. A. Onwachi Willig, E. Howe and M. Campbell, Cracking the Egg, Which Came First, Stigma or Affirmative Action, 96 Cal L. Rev, 1299 8 C. E. G. I. D., at 1343-1344, study of seven law schools showing that stigma results from racial stereotypes that have attached historically to different groups, regardless of affirmative action's existence. Indeed, Equating state-sponsored segregation with race-conscious admissions policies that promote racial integration trivializes the harms of segregation and offends Brow and transformative legacy. School segregation has a detrimental effect on Black students by denoting the inferiority of their status in the community and by depriving them of some of the benefits they would receive in a racially integrated school system. 347 U.S. at 494. In sharp contrast, Race-conscious college admissions ensure that higher education is visibly open to and inclusive of talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 332. These two uses of race are not created equal. They are not equally objectionable, I'd at 327. Relatedly, Justice Thomas suggests that race-conscious college admissions policies harm racial minorities by increasing affinity-based activities on college campuses. Anti- at 46. Not only is there no evidence of a causal connection between the use of race in college admissions and the supposed rise of those activities, but Justice Thomas points to no evidence that affinity groups cause any harm. Affinity-based activities actually help racial minorities improve their visibility on college campuses and decrease racial stigma and vulnerability to stereotypes caused by conditions of racial isolation and tokenization. Ujaya Kumar, why are all black students still sitting together in the proverbial college cafeteria? Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA, October 2015. See also brief for respondent students in number 21 to 707, P42, collecting student testimony demonstrating that affinity groups beget important academic and social benefits for racial minorities. For app in number 21199 at 1591, Harvard Working Group on Diversity and Inclusion Report, noting that concerns that culturally specific spaces or affinity-themed housing will isolate student minorities are misguided because those spaces allow students to come together to deal with intellectual, emotional, and social challenges. Citing no evidence, Justice Thomas also suggests that race-conscious admissions programs discriminate against Asian American students. Anti at 43-44. It is true that SFFA alleged D that Harvard discriminates against Asian American students, anti at 43. Specifically, SFFA argued that Harvard discriminates against Asian American applicants vis-a-vis -vis white applicants through the use of the personal rating, an allegedly highly subjective component of the admissions process that is susceptible to stereotyping and bias. 
Harvard 2, 980F3D at 196. See Brief for Professors of Economics as Amishi Curie 24. It is also true, however, that there was a lengthy trial to test those allegations, which SFFA lost. Justice Thomas points to no legal or factual error below, precisely because there is none. To begin, this part of SFFA's discrimination claim does not even fall under the strict scrutiny framework in Grutter and its progeny, which concerns the use of racial classifications. The personal rating is a facially race-neutral component of Harvard's admissions policy. Therefore, even assuming for the sake of argument that Harvard engages in racial discrimination through the personal rating, there is no connection between that rating and the remedy that SFFA sought and that the majority grants today ending the limited use of race in the entire admissions process. In any event, after assessing the credibility of fact witnesses and considering extensive documentary evidence and expert testimony, the courts below found no discrimination against Asian Americans. Harvard 2, 980F3D at 195N, 34, 202, C. Ide at 195, 204. There is no question that the Asian American community continues to struggle against potent and dehumanizing stereotypes in our society. It is precisely because racial discrimination persists in our society, however, that the use of race in college admissions to achieve racially diverse classes is critical to improving cross-racial understanding and breaking down racial stereotypes. See Supra at 16. Indeed, the record. D shows that some Asian American applicants are actually advantaged by Harvard's use of race, Harvard 2, 980F, 3D at 191, and eliminating consideration of race would significantly disadvantage at least some Asian American applicants, Harvard 1, 397F sub, 3D at 194. Race-conscious holistic admissions that contextualize the racial identity of each individual allow Asian American applicants who would be less likely to be admitted without a comprehensive understanding of their background to explain the value of their unique background, heritage, and perspective. I'd at 195. Because the Asian American community is not a monolith, race-conscious holistic admissions allow colleges and universities to consider the vast differences within that community. ALDEF, Brief 4-14. Harvard's application files show that race-conscious holistic admissions allow Harvard to value the diversity of Asian American applicants' experiences. Harvard College Brief 23. Moreover, the admission rates of Asian Americans at institutions with race-conscious admissions policies, including at Harvard, have been steadily increasing for decades. Harvard 2, 980F 3D at 198. By contrast, Asian American enrollment declined at elite universities that are prohibited by state law from considering race. CEL Def Brief 27, Brief for 25 Diverse, California-Focused Bar Associations at AL, as Amishi Curie, 1920-23. At bottom, race-conscious admissions benefit all students, including racial minorities. That includes the Asian American community. Finally, Justice Thomas belies reality by suggesting that Experts and elites with views similar to those that motivated Dred Scott and Plessy are the ones who support race-conscious admissions. Anti at 39. The plethora of young students of color who testified in favor of race consciousness proves otherwise. See Supra at 46 to 47. See also Infra at 64 67, discussing numerous amici from many sectors of society supporting respondents' policies. Not a single student let alone any racial minority affected by the court's decision testified in favor of SFFA in these cases. C. In its radical claim to power, the court does not even acknowledge the important reliance interests that this court's precedents have generated. Dobbs, 597 U.S., dissenting opinion, slip op at 53. Significant rights and expectations will be affected by today's decision nonetheless. Those interests supply added force in favor of stare decisis. Hilton v. South Carolina Public Railways Common, 502 U.S. 197-202, 1991. Students of all backgrounds have formed settled expectations that universities with race-conscious policies will provide diverse, cross-cultural experiences that will better prepare them to excel in our increasingly diverse world. Brief for respondent students in number 21 to 707 at 45, see Harvard College Brief 6 to 11, collecting student testimony. 
Respondents in other colleges and universities with race-conscious admissions programs similarly have concrete reliance interests because they have spent significant resources in an effort to comply with this court's precedents. Universities have designed courses that draw on the benefits of a diverse student body, hired faculty whose research is enriched by the diversity of the student body, and promoted their learning environments to prospective students who have enrolled based on the understanding that they could obtain the benefits of diversity of all kinds. Brief for respondent in number 20, 1199 at 4041, internal quotation marks omitted. Universities also have expended vast financial and other resources in training thousands of application readers on how to faithfully apply this court's guardrails on the use of race in admissions. Brief for university respondents in number 21707, P44. Yet today's decision abruptly forces them to fundamentally alter their admissions practices. I'd, at 45, see also brief for Massachusetts Institute of Technology at Al as Amishi Curia 25 to 26. Brief for Amherst College at Al as Amishi Curia 23 to 25, Amherst Brief. As to Title VI in particular, colleges and universities have relied on Grutter for decades in accepting federal funds. See brief for United States as Amicus Curiae in number 20-1199, P25, United States Brief, Georgetown Brief 16. The court's failure to weigh these reliance interests is a stunning indictment of its decision. Dobbs, 597 U.S., Descending Opinion, Slip Op at 55. Avor. The use of race in college admissions has had profound consequences by increasing the enrollment of underrepresented minorities on college campuses. This court presupposes that segregation is a sin of the past and that race-conscious college admissions have played no role in the progress society has made. The fact that affirmative action in higher education has worked and is continuing to work is no reason to abandon the practice today. Shelby County v. Holder 570 U.S. 529 of 2013. Ginsburg J. Dissenting. It is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. Experience teaches that the consequences of today's decision will be destructive. The two lengthy trials below simply confirmed what we already knew. Superficial colorblindness in a society that systematically segregates opportunity will cause a sharp decline in the rates at which underrepresented minority students enroll in our nation's colleges and universities, turning the clock back and undoing the slow yet significant progress already achieved. See Schuett, 572 U.S., at 384, 390, Sotomayor J., dissenting, collecting statistics from states that have banned the use of race in college admissions. See also Amherst Brief 13, noting that eliminating the use of race in college admissions will take black student enrollment at elite universities back to levels this country saw in the early 1960s. After California amended its state constitution to prohibit race-conscious college admissions in 1996, for example, freshman enrollees from underrepresented minority groups dropped precipitously in California public universities. Brief for President and Chancellors of the University of California as Amici Curie, 4, 9, 11 to 13. The decline was particularly devastating at California's most selective campuses, where the rates of admission of underrepresented groups dropped by 50% or more. I'd at 412. At the University of California, Berkeley, a top public university not just in California but also nationally, the percentage of black students in the freshman class dropped from 6.32% in 1995 to 3.37% in 1998, ID at 12.13. Latino representation similarly dropped from 15.57% to 7.28% during that period at Berkeley, even though Latinos represented 31% of California public high school graduates, ID at 13.00. To this day, the student population at California universities still reflects a persistent inability to increase opportunities for all racial groups, I'd at 23. For example, as of 2019, the proportion of black freshmen at Berkeley was 2.76%, well below the pre-constitutional amendment level in 1996, which was 6.32%. IBID. Latinos composed about 15% of freshman students at Berkeley in 2019, despite making up 52% of all California public high school graduates. I'd at 24. See also, 
brief for University of Michigan as Amicus Curiae 2124, noting similar trends at the University of Michigan from 2006, the last admission cycle before Michigan's ban on race-conscious admissions took effect, through present. I'd at 2425, explaining that the university's experience is largely consistent with other schools that do not consider race as a factor in admissions, including, for example, the University of Oklahoma's most prestigious campus. The costly result of today's decision harms not just respondents and students, but also our institutions and democratic society more broadly. Dozens of Amici from nearly every sector of society agree that the absence of race-conscious college admissions will decrease the pipeline of racially diverse college graduates to crucial professions. Those Amici include the United States, which emphasizes the need for diversity in the nation's military, see United States Brief 12 to 18, and in the federal workforce more generally, I'd at 19 to 20, discussing various federal agencies, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. The United States explains that the nation's military strength and readiness depend on a pipeline of officers who are both highly qualified and racially diverse and who have been educated in diverse environments that prepare them to lead increasingly diverse forces. I'd at 12. That is true not just at the military service academies, but at civilian universities, including Harvard, that host Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC programs, and educate students who go on to become officers. I bid. Top former military leaders agree. See brief for Adam Charles S. Abbott et al. as Amici Curia III, noting that in Amici's professional judgment, the status quo, which permits service academies and civilian universities to consider racial diversity as one factor among many in their admissions practices, is essential to the continued vitality of the U.S. military. Indeed, history teaches that racial diversity is a national security imperative. During the Vietnam War, for example, lack of racial diversity threatened the integrity and performance of the nation's military because it fueled perceptions of racial ethnic minorities serving as cannon fodder for white military leaders. Military leadership diversity common, from representation to inclusion, diversity leadership for the 21st century military 615-2011. See also, e.g. R. Stillman, racial unrest in the military, the challenge and the response, 34 Pub Admin Rev. 221-221-22-1974, discussing other examples of racial unrest. Based on lessons from decades of battlefield experience, it has been the long-standing military judgment across administrations that racial diversity is essential to achieving a mission-ready military and to ensuring the nation's ability to compete, deter, and win in today's increasingly complex global security environment. United States Brief 13, internal quotation marks omitted. The majority recognizes the compelling need for diversity in the military and the national security implications at stake, see ANTI, at 22 and 4. But it ends race-conscious college admissions at civilian universities implicating those interests anyway. Amici also tell the court that race-conscious college admissions are critical for providing equitable and effective public services. State and local governments require public servants educated in diverse environments who can identify, understand, and respond to perspectives in our increasingly diverse communities. Brief for Southern Governors as Amici Curie 5 to 8, Southern Governors Brief. Likewise, increasing the number of students from underrepresented backgrounds who join the ranks of medical professionals improves health care access and health outcomes in medically underserved communities. Brief for Massachusetts et al. as Amici Curie 10. See Brief for Association of American Medical Colleges et al. as Amici Curie 5, noting also that all physicians become better practitioners when they learn in a racially diverse environment. So too, Greater diversity within the teacher workforce improves student academic achievement in primary public schools. Brief for Massachusetts et al. as Amici Curie 15 to 17. See Brief for American Federation of Teachers as Amicus Curie 8. There are few professions with broader social impact than teaching. A diverse pipeline of college graduates also ensures a diverse legal profession, which demonstrates that the justice system serves the public in a fair and inclusive manner. 
brief for American Bar ASOC, IATION as Amicus Curiae 18. See also brief for Law Firm Anti-Racism Alliance as Amicus Curiae 1, 6. More than 300 law firms in all 50 states supporting race-conscious college admissions in light of the influence and power that lawyers wield in the American system of government. Examples of other industries and professions that benefit from race-conscious college admissions abound. American businesses emphasize that a diverse workforce improves business performance, better serves a diverse consumer marketplace, and strengthens the overall American economy. Brief for major American business enterprises as Amici Curie 5 to 27. A diverse pipeline of college graduates also improves research by reducing bias and increasing group collaboration. Brief for individual scientists as Amici Curie 1314. It creates a more equitable and inclusive media industry that communicates diverse viewpoints and perspectives. Brief for Multicultural Media, Telecom and Internet Council, Inc., et al., as Amici Curie 6. It also drives innovation in an increasingly global science and technology industry. Brief for Applied Materials, Inc., et al., as Amici Curie 1120. Today's decision further entrenches racial inequality by making these pipelines to leadership roles less diverse. A college degree, particularly from an elite institution, carries with it the benefit of powerful networks and the opportunity for socioeconomic mobility. Admission to college is therefore often the entry ticket to top jobs in workplaces where important decisions are made. The overwhelming majority of members of Congress have a college degree. So do most business leaders. Indeed, many state and local leaders in North Carolina attended college in the UNC system. See Southern Governor's Brief 8. More than half of judges on the North Carolina Supreme Court and Court of Appeals graduated from the UNC system, for example, and nearly a third of the governor's cabinet attended UNC, IBID. A less diverse pipeline to these top jobs accumulates wealth and power unequally across racial lines, exacerbating racial disparities in a society that already dispenses prestige and privilege based on race. The court ignores the dangerous consequences of an America where its leadership does not reflect the diversity of the people. A system of government that visibly lacks a path to leadership open to every race cannot withstand scrutiny in the eyes of the citizenry. Gruder, 539 U.S. at 332. Gross disparity in representation leads the public to wonder whether they can ever belong in our nation's institutions, including this one, and whether those institutions work for them. Tour of Oral Arg in number 21707, P171. The court is going to hear from 27 advocates in this sitting of the oral argument calendar, and two are women, even though women today are 50% or more of law school graduates. And I think it would be reasonable for a woman to look at that and wonder, is that a path that's open to me to be a Supreme Court advocate? Remarks of Solicitor General Elizabeth Preliger. By ending race-conscious college admissions, this court closes the door of opportunity that the court's precedents helped open to young students of every race. It creates a leadership pipeline that is less diverse than our increasingly diverse society, reserving positions of influence, affluence, and prestige in America for a predominantly white pool of college graduates. Baki for 38 U.S. at 401, opinion of Marshall J., at its core, today's decision exacerbates segregation and diminishes the inclusivity of our nation's institutions in service of superficial neutrality that promotes indifference to inequality and ignores the reality of race. True equality of educational opportunity in racially diverse schools is an essential component of the fabric of our democratic society. It is an interest of the highest order and a foundational requirement for the promotion of equal protection under the the law. Brown recognized that passive race neutrality was inadequate to achieve the constitutional guarantee of racial equality in a nation where the effects of segregation persist. In a society where race continues to matter, there is no constitutional requirement that institutions attempting to remedy their legacies of racial exclusion must operate with a blindfold. Today, this court overrules decades of precedent and imposes a superficial rule of race blindness on the nation. The devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. The majority's vision of race neutrality 
will entrench racial segregation in higher education because racial inequality will persist so long as it is ignored. Notwithstanding this court's actions, however, society's progress toward equality cannot be permanently halted. Diversity is now a fundamental American value housed in our varied and multicultural American community that only continues to grow. The pursuit of racial diversity will go on. Although the court has stripped out almost all uses of race in college admissions, universities can and should continue to use all available tools to meet society's needs for diversity in education. Despite the court's unjustified exercise of power, the opinion today will serve only to highlight the court's own impotence in the face of an America whose cries for equality resound. As has been the case before in the history of American democracy, the arc of the moral universe will bend toward racial justice despite the court's efforts today to impede its progress. Martin Luther King, Our God is Marching On. Speech, Marmor 25th, 1965.